The real measure of your wealth is how much you'd be worth if you lost all of your money. Hey everyone, welcome to the Make Your Money Matter Show. I'm your host, Brad Barrett. I'm also the managing director and partner here at One Capital Management, reminding you that your money matters. Today on the Make Your Money Matter Show, we're gonna be talking about the five things no one ever told you about money. But before we do that, make sure to smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. All right, let's get into it. When it comes down to the basics of money, there are only a few things you really need to know. How to make it, how to grow it, and how to keep it. Now, obviously within those three camps, a lot happens. And a lot of it's, believe it or not, topical. I mean, the first half of this year alone, 2022, a lot has happened. We've seen volatility in our markets. We've seen conflict overseas. We've had discussions around rate hikes and then the rate hikes actually happening. Uh, everything from supply chain issues, really spilling over from, from last year. We've had State of the Unions from our administration. A lot has happened. And I know, and I may be oversimplifying this statement of how to make it, grow it, and keep it, but most people, and I think really be honest with ourselves, we don't understand the basics of money. And I think it's really important, especially here on this show as we talk with our clients about this, as I'm open about this, it's okay to not know about money. And let me share something real quickly and be vulnerable. I grew up not knowing really anything about construction or about cars. Now, as a guy, as I got older, I realized that that's something I actually need to know about and felt somewhat insecure about. But I'm honest with myself and saying, you know what? I don't. So I'd rather partner to my weaknesses. And I share that story, a very simple one, obviously, simply to state that I think money is a topic that we tend to almost treat like it's voodoo or something. We don't want to talk about it, but we really should. And if you think about the topic we're going to talk about today, about the things that we should have been taught in school, you weren't taught about a mortgage in high school or college. I mean, and if you did speak about a mortgage, maybe with an economics professor, or maybe if you were in business school and college, they might not necessarily have taught you how to fill out the HUD form or the process uh, with a real estate agent. I mean, we're taught these things in large part through experience. And in my 20 years of being in the financial services industry, a lot of what I've realized is that education around money matters most to each of us. And for me, as I've shared on this show, and I've shared with on our radio programs and our podcasts, there's two ways we learn about money. One is we learn about it from our God-given talents, are no different than the color of our eyes. And then the second is circumstantial, what we've lived through. And for me, as I've shared my story before, when I was 16 years old, uh, the company that my dad worked for for nearly 20 years went bankrupt. And between myself and my sisters, there was a lot going on. It was a scary time for him and for us, because we were just kids. Now, to his credit, he shielded a lot of it from us, but I saw you know, the evil in the corporate world from one guy just deciding to cook the books, and he's rotting in a jail cell somewhere, as he should be, because he basically bankrupted a company, and thousands of people were affected. And the report of thousands of people, it's actually much more than that, because like us, our families, their families were affected. And I made that decision that day. I'll never forget that. And why I'm speaking to you here today was, I made two decisions. One, I was gonna learn everything I possibly could about money for myself. And two, I wanted to use that to help people. And that's why I'm here talking to you today and specifically about this subject matter. So these five key things about money that I'm gonna bring up today, they might be simple in nature, but they're the bedrock or the foundation of what I feel a lot of people need to understand about money. So let's get into this. Number one is compound interest. Let's go back to the basics here and start with that subject alone. What you need to know about compound interest. Albert Einstein once wrote, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. Do not be the one paying it. If you're earning interest or reaping dividends from an investment, it grows over time. We can see that in theory. But let's say, let me give you an example. We're earning 2% interest on $100. Now that's not much, but it will increase over time through compound interest. So that $100 that was earning 2% is $2 in interest every year. Year number two, 
you now have not $100, but $102. And the 2% interest rate is now earning 2% on 102. Now you can see if you extrapolate that out, it starts to grow. Yes, it's basic, but boy, is it important. Remember, he who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. So we have to think about applying that to larger sums of money, our investments, our retirement assets uh, over larger and longer periods of time. Now I'm gonna come out of the gate here with a very rudimentary concept around money. But I think as we think about interest, we should think about dividends. We think about adding to it. And it's really important tool to remember as we talk about some of these five main areas around money. And one little anecdote I wanna add here to number one around compound interest is the rule of 72. Now this is a little bit more of an advanced theory, but it's really actually a simple mathematical problem, but it's a really great one to look at. For any of you out there, whether you're just a new investor trying to learn about savings and investing, or you are been working and saving and investing for 30 years, the rule of 72 is a basic math function that allows you to take the interest you've earned or will earn, divide that by the number 72, that'll tell you that the output will tell you how many years it will take for your money to double. Okay, let's do a quick math here for a second. Let's say you're earning 9% interest every year. You divide that by 72, eight years, every eight years, you will double your money. You have $100,000 earning 9%. Every eight years, that 100 will go to 200, 200 to 400, 400 to 800, and so on. Now, I bring that analogy and that mathematical equation up, the rule of 72, and you can look this up because it has a lot to do with compound interest. Number two, now this is both topical and important always, inflation. We need to understand inflation and what that means for us because it eats away at our money. And right now I say it's topical because we've been talking about it with our clients here at One Capital and on the Make Your Money Matter show. And I wanna start out with inflation being number two here. It's a tricky one because it's not tangible. And what do I mean by that? You can't touch, feel, and taste it. It's not something right in front of you. It's not this pen that I can look at and touch and feel like, oh, okay, that's inflation. I say that because inflation's intangible. You can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't taste it. You only know it's real when you go to the gas pump, as an example, or go buy that carton of milk, and you know psychologically that what you were paying today is no longer what you were paying yesterday. And now, in the state of California where we are, as an example, we're paying $6 a gallon. Now, across the country, the natural average is still right around four and a half because of everything that's been going on this past let's say 12 to 15 months. And I've spoken a lot about this on the Make Your Money Matter show, but inflation is a really important one. Now, while inflation isn't bad for everything, it's bad for our wallets when we're buying things or you know certain aspects of daily life, there are asset classes that do well. Things like real estate, there are assets that don't do well in inflationary time periods, areas like cash, because it's all about subtraction from what you will think you are adding. And that's why I wanna simplify it. If the annual inflation rate, let's just use a national average for a second. I know it's a little bit hotter right now and we've talked a lot about that on the show, but if the national average year over year was 3%, but your savings account only earns 1%, and by the way, that'd be a great savings account right now. If the national average of inflation is 3%, but you're only earning one, your drawdown is 2%. The, essentially, the cost of goods and services has outpaced the buying power of the money in your savings account. So in general terms, inflation eats away at your money. Because again, and it's a hard concept because it isn't tangible, we can't see it. Now, a quick aside, Benjamin Graham, sometimes considered the father of investing, wrote an incredible book called Security Analysis. And it's for many in the investor world, kind of the investor's Bible. And he's quoted in saying, the investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself. Why do I bring this quote up at this point? Because education around this topic, inflation, has a lot to do with how we perceive money. Many times I have conversations with clients around the concept of cash and ironically, the concept of inflation. The basics of math and why I labeled this one inflation number two just past compound interest of the fundamentals of things we should have been taught earlier on is this concept of being conservative or aggressive. These are adjectives that the financial services industry has really marketed to us over many, many years. 
and I personally believe, this is a personal belief again, that I, I, I'm not sure that we all fit into each camp. I think everything needs to be diagnosed and discussed with the council, with an advisor to really make sure that you're doing what's right with your money. And I've said before, why you do what you do with your money matters. And here's why I bring this up. Many people come in and I talk to them. We do our discovery meeting with them around cash and investing and the risks associated with it. If you understand basic math, and we know that inflation is going to be three, four, five percent for the next little while, we're in an inflationary time period. Yes, that's lower than what's going on right now, but when you look at the kind of reverting back to the mean over the long haul, three, four, five percent, let's say, and you're in cash earning less than one percent, you you may not see a negative return on your statement from your bank, but you will when you are now paying four dollars and fifty cents for that cup of coffee when you used to be paying three dollars and fifty cents. That's purchasing power. And I personally, as I said earlier, wasn't raised to understand certain things around certain subject matters, like a car or what a hammer was. <laughs> but I do know that when I learned about money, I realized that many people struggle in this area. And I want to say this, that I believe this, you want to partner with your weaknesses. And a lot of times money is a humbling topic for sure, especially with something as we know consciously that, okay, I can't go earn 1%, but pay debt or pay inflation of three or 4%, but why can I make that, why can I make that move? Like what's stopping me? And it's education. And I really like to peel through the layers here because the reality is money means something to every person and understanding what it means to you is really important. And specifically, these first two things I brought up of compound interest and inflation, albeit somewhat simple and really widely used terms, really needs to be dissected and understood so that you truly understand it. And remember, when we're talking about foundational wisdom, before we move on to these next three around money, remember this, Proverbs 4, 6, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom, seeking it, understanding it, using it for how you need to understand basic things matters. It will protect you. All right. Number three. Now we're going to get into the investing side here. We started with compound interest and the simple idea of math and how that can grow over time. We talked about inflation because that can eat away at your returns. Remember, we're talking about making it, growing it, and keeping it. Let's get into the growing it category for a second. I want to talk about bonds. Okay. First off, I want to define bonds. You and I know that as what's called fixed interest. That is something that we receive from a municipality, from a government, from a corporation. They are issuing debt, essentially. We are picking up on that with quote unquote guarantee that we'll get paid back over a certain amount of time and be paid a certain interest. It is considered fixed and it is considered less volatile or less quote unquote risky than the market. One thing to understand about bonds is, in my opinion, they tend to run the market. They're not the sexiest thing to talk about, but they are very important, which is why I have it at number three here. Understanding this and understanding how this will mix into your investments matters a lot. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And the reason why I bring why bonds somewhat run the market, think about it. Our mortgage rates are run off, for large part, the 10-year note. And a lot of banks' interest rates are run on what bond prices are doing or the bond market is doing. And so you have to understand the symbiotic relationship between interest rates and bond prices. And I always do this with our clients and we're in person together. And if you can visualize this with me, think of a seesaw for a second. One side goes up, the other side goes down. That's the relationship we should have and understand between interest rates and bond prices. When interest rates rise, our bond prices will tend to fall and vice versa. The inverse is also true. When interest rates fall, bond prices will rise. Now I share this and I often share this around bonds and why this is so important is we don't want to admit this, but we don't really all the time understand bonds. And I'm not going to dissect it so much today. So much as to say that bonds need to be understood when it relates to your investments for a couple reasons. One, as I already mentioned, it is a large part of the market. It's also that secured area, that, that safe haven, if you will, when there's volatility or fear or consumer sentiment in the market, largely about what we've been seeing, like take this year, for example, that's one of these safe havens that money tends to go to. We talk a lot about bonds here with our clients 
uh, largely because it's a diversifier. It has a really good place in anyone's portfolio. And I think when the consumer sentiments and people are feeling a little volatile around markets, as I mentioned, and unsure what markets are going to do, bonds come into place to pick up and, and fill that void, if you will, while also keeping that fixed income steadily coming in. So understanding how bonds work is really important. And one of the things I use to really start the conversation, and I want to share it on this show today, uh, if you'd like to find more about this or want to speak with us, we're happy to go through that, is relating it to a CD. Uh, we understand what a certificate of deposit is typically with a bank. You, you put it for six months, a year, two years, maybe go out as far as five years. And those are really the same components as it relates to a bond. You put it in for six months, you'll get, let's say, half percent. This is a hypothetical. You put it in for six months, you get half percent. You put it in for one year, you get 1%, two years, 1.5%. And why I illustrate that is because it's the same relationship with bonds. The longer you go out, the more interest you'll typically receive unless you're in inverted yield. So that term you've heard before, inverted yield, all that means is short money becomes more attractive than long money. And so typically that's a certain indicator for certain things, but we're gonna focus on the basics of duration, the time period, the interest, typically the longer you go out, the more you'll receive, and the actual bond itself of coming back to maturity. When you put $100 into a CD, you're gonna get that $100 back after six months or a year or two years, as well as your interest. The same is true of a bond. Now, there are more components that go into a bond because it's not issued by a bank. It could be from a corporation or something like that. But understanding that is really important when it comes to the two other items I brought up around compound interest and inflation, because those are the first three things to set the tone here on the base level of foundational aspects when it comes to money and a few other anecdotes I put in there as well. All right, number four is debt. Something I talk about with our clients heavily around debt management and really classifying debt. And I think any of us getting into the world of understanding what money is, you need to understand debt and how it's useful and how it's not useful. Now we had a whole episode on this and I really would advise you going back to it around managing your debt and how to pay off debt because it is a struggle for many people and we don't understand it. And this is actually one of the main reasons why I focused this week's episode because we got a lot of great response from the show we did around debt management. And I hear that from clients all the time. And I think we should start off with classifying debt. Let's put it into two camps, good debt and bad debt. Good debt is low interest, typically deductible and for an asset. A great example is a mortgage. Now the inverse is basically the inverse of every single one of those three of bad debt. It is higher interest. It is typically not deductible and it's not necessarily for an asset or it's not collateralized by an asset. The best example there is a credit card, right? It's typically double digit interest rate. It's not deductible and it's really not for an asset. It's for that TV or that Vegas trip you wanted to take. So you really focus on debt and you want to classify those two to make sure that the two debts and how it relates to your money and your investments matters. And let's talk about credit card debt. Let's talk about the unsecured debt for a second. Uh, let me give you an example of a credit card that you're paying 5% on. Now, by the way, you're probably stoked if you're getting 5% on a credit card right now. Uh, and that 5% credit that you're paying on has $10,000 of a balance. You have another card that has $5,000 of balance and only is 2%. Now, everyone listening here, as I mentioned before, is probably loving those interest rates and probably a bad example when it comes to credit cards, but just stay with me for a second. Now, let's say you get a tax re refund or a tax return in a year, which happens for a lot of our clients of $5,000. Your first thought is, if you're thinking this way, which is good, is to chip away at your debt. I'll say this very openly. When you pay off debt, let's say you're paying off debt for three, four or 5%, that's the same as making money. That's the same as making three or four or 5%. So the question we get sometimes of, should I invest that 5,000 or pay off our debt? I say, do you have debt? If the answer is yes, pay that off first. But let's say in my example, you have $5,000 of a tax refund. You're thinking, okay, I wanna pay off that credit card that is $5,000 because I pay the whole card off. But if you recall, that $5,000 credit card was only paying 2%. You have a $10,000 paying 5%. We want to focus not on the balance, but the interest rate. The higher interest rate is what you want to pay off first, not the higher or the lower balance. You want to pay off the higher interest rate first because higher interest over time will cost you if you don't pay that off. So even though you're not going to pay off the full balance, you're going to pay 
much less over time on my example by paying the higher interest rate first. So understanding debt strategies is very important and foundational to your understanding of money in general. And I think the rule of money and wealth is really important when it comes to something like debt. We all can carry debt. And again, there's good debt and bad debt. And I've, again, I've talked about this on previous shows uh, and with clients here at One Capital Management. Debt in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you use it for a purpose. For example, taking leverage or debt on investing in an asset may make sense. Taking leverage or debt for a depreciating asset may not. Think real estate or a business versus maybe a trip or a credit card. The rule of money and wealth, I think, is very simple. Don't buy a $500 wallet and have nothing in it. Buy a $100 wallet and put $400 in it. Don't go broke trying to look rich because debt nowadays has a lot of an impact for us when we look at that. So being mindful of the perspective you have on something like debt matters a lot. Said differently, if it doesn't bring you peace, profit, or purpose, then don't give it your time, energy, or attention. And the fifth and final one today is investing. Obviously a broad subject, but I wanna focus on diversification. And when I talk about these five things today of what I think we should have been taught around money, around compound interest, inflation, around bonds, and now talking about items like investing, it's really important to understand that investing, when you talk about diversification, we have to understand where we can invest in this world. So I'm gonna make this as simple as I possibly can for a second. There is five areas to invest in this world. And I know many people on TV shows and, and pundits and writers, they can make careers, literal, literal careers, around talking about one of these five categories. Let me break it down for you to truly understand this. There is five areas to invest. There is cash, that's cash in our pocket, CDs, money markets, cash you have buried in the backyard. There's fixed income, which we talked about, that's bonds. We know those as corporate bonds, government bonds, municipality bonds. There is the market or equities uh, that can be invested in mutual funds, exchange traded funds, index funds, or just direct stocks. There's commodities, gold, silver, oil, coffee beans. And then there's real estate. Everything from your home, your primary, residence to raw land, to corporate real estate, to section eight housing investments, to opportunity zones, to rental properties. So those five areas, if you look at diversification, any good money manager, anyone out there looking to diversify their account needs to diversify between those five asset classes. And when you look at an item of like this year, for example, when you've seen this crazy volatility we've been seeing in the market, that's one of the five areas. So when money leaves that area, it has to go somewhere else. Where does it go? Our job is to find out where it goes of those areas. Now, I know that may seem very, uh, again, simplistic, but I think it's a great place to start when you talk about your education around money. And to wrap up on this week's topic of the five key areas around money that we should have been taught earlier on, but probably weren't. I mean, going back to our topic number one, interest, uh, we talked about inflation, we talked about bonds, we talked about understanding your debt, and then we talked about investing and in particular, diversifying in the asset classes you have out there to look at. And once you learn how to spend your money to make money in those categories I mentioned, to become wealthy, wealth comes to you. And again, being wealthy is a matter of perspective for each person, but becoming wealthy is a matter of time, not necessarily a matter of strategy. And time is the really the key thing that I think everyone around money should understand when it comes to investing. Carl Jung once said, know all the theories, master all the techniques, but as you touch a human soul, be just that, another human soul. Today's episode, I really wanted to focus on that. I wanted to know the theories and the techniques that I've learned. I want to share those with you, bring it back to down to a foundational level, but really be just that to you, a, a, a human. And, and with that, I'd be remiss if I didn't add this last little anecdote from myself around money and the concept of it because I think there's a higher purpose for us all, for each of us individually and specifically. The real measure of your wealth is how much you'd be worth if you lost all of your money. It's time to answer your questions. If you have a specific question or topic you'd like me to address, you can leave it here in the comments section. Or again, if you wanna talk about something a little bit more individual or personal or one-on-one, -on -one, just go to the about page on this channel and you can send us an email. As always, we keep your questions I read here anonymous, so you never have to worry 
about uh, your name being shared or anything like that. But we'd love to hear from you. You know, today's question was actually an interesting one. I chose this one because I think it had a bigger meaning and maybe even a bigger question. The question came in essentially, is investing or is growing and, and being greedy a bad thing? Is money essentially what, what this listener and this, this viewer was asking was, you know, is growing your money in this world uh, of everything that's going on, all the bad and all the good, is it a bad thing? And I wanna answer it this way. I think one of the biggest misnomers we see out there is that money is evil. And I think sometimes we get that and we misread it from actually a biblical reference. First Timothy 6.10 talks about this. It says the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. Money itself is neither good nor bad, but understanding its purpose for you and what it can do for you, for your family, for your community, and ultimately for our country and the world has a lot of impact. So I spend, and I have spent nearly 20 years advocating and educating around money and, and the use of it for the growth of it, for the betterment of yourself. And again, of your surroundings, your, your neighborhood, your family, your community. So no, I don't think that having a capitalistic point of view of, of trying to grow, grow, grow is a bad thing unless it consumes you. If it becomes your everything, then yes, you kind of lost sight of the goal. It should serve you. And I say it this way, money is a great employee, but a terrible boss. Don't let it run your life. Get in control of it. At some point in your investing and your saving life, you're gonna really want to make sure that you have it under your employment, not the other way around. There's an old saying, right? Work smarter, not harder. At some point, make sure your money is working for you and not you working for it. So I love the question. I love the idea and the concept around that question. And I wanted to share that. I hope it was okay sharing that kind of purposeful thing because I think money will really kind of break it down into become some numerical two-dimensional thing. And it's not. It's much more three-dimensional. It's very dynamic. It impacts every family that we serve here at One Capital Management. And I really wanted to share that with our viewers on the Make Your Money Matter show. I think it has a lot of impact and what it can do for you and for your overall purpose. And finding that matters a lot. And as I said, Earlier, I think your worth is not wrapped up in your net worth of a number. It has a lot to do with what you do with your money. And that's why I named the show this way. Why money matters to you is its own individual topic. So again, if you have a question or a comment you'd like me to read here on the show, you can leave it in the comments section or email us in the about page on our channel. Before we go today, if you found this show or anything we talked about today helpful and wanna learn more, you can visit us on our website at onecapital.com or you can scan the QR code on the screen with your smartphone to get you there. And you can also call or text us. We wanna hear from you, we wanna help. Listen, there's no pressure here. We don't treat people like a number. In fact, we value relationships. It's the lifeblood of what we do. So click, call, or text us today. And if you're not following us on social media, you should be. We're sharing great information on all of our social media platforms. And as I often say, if you enjoy the show, Share with someone you like. And I guess if you don't like the show, share with someone you don't like. But until next time, always remember, make your money matter.